Hi, I'm Johnny Engineer Termel, and I gotta ask, how many times have you seen Mr. Spock save a whole planet by debugging bad software on the central computer? Maybe we can pull a Spock move too. So, there are 95 million unemployed adults in the United States, 3 million homeless, and 18 million empty homes. So, you think Mr. Spock could figure out a way to handle 3 million homeless with only 18 million empty homes? We'll figure that out. So, this is the book by Scott Adams, the creator of Dilbert, my favorite engineer, and it has opened a whole new world of information about persuasion. And, for instance, he pointed out how now social media is the brain of politics in some ways. And then wham, here came an example when the Trump administration put out the proposal for the trophies for hunters of exotic game who would be allowed to import them. And there was such a huge outcry that Mr. Trump said, I'm not going to do that. Hang on, I'm going to look into it. And thank you for the feedback, I'm sure. So, in that way, yes, social media seems to be able to handle and do the thinking for politics. So, we're going to see if that can't be solved to the satisfaction of the 3 million homeless. And at the same time, maybe 15 other million people moving on out of their parents' basements into the other 15 million empty homes. So, now, the book is Win Bigly. And let's think to your favorite movie character who knew how to not only win bigly, but win biggestly, Mr. Spock. Here's the situation. Captain, if you do A, we're going to survive nine times out of ten. If you do B, we're going to survive seven times out of ten. Captain Kirk, mm, I feel lucky. I think we'll go with B. Ah, Mr. Spock, sorry, sir, I'm relieving you of command. All right? So... Mr. Spock was the science officer who could figure out the odds of winning and the winningest way to go. And so can I. After my degree in systems engineering, which is applied science, and I scored 100% in physics for people who think engineers aren't scientists, I became teaching assistant of Canada's only mathematics of gambling course. And then I became a professional gambler rather than an engineer. And this was in 1974 when How to Beat Blackjack had just come out, beat the blank, beat the banker, uh, beat the dealer. And uh, I learned how to count cards. And I was one of the first card counters to go and beat up on Las Vegas. And for five years, I'd go on junkets and, you know, beat them. I went on Caesar's Chariot once. I would bet Donald Trump rode Caesar's chariot. He was in his early 30s, rich kid, too. I guess suppose he would have had a chance to go on Caesar's chariot, too. Then in 1975, I trained a team of university student card counters. Now, there have been movies about other teams decades later, but I ran the first one to take on Vegas. And uh, then, of course, after I got barred in Las Vegas... I said, how come I can't play blackjack in Canada? As long as they can be the bank, it's fair. Just like poker. And poker's legal. So I decided to try and legalize gambling in Canada. And I became Ottawa's gambling crusader. And I got busted. And a judge found me guilty. said, you're too good. Therefore, that's an edge. Therefore, that's illegal. And over the years, I got busted again and again and again. Trying to run disco casinos and trying to run it on a boat. And I'll... Finally, in 1988, after being busted, a judge said, oh, everybody could be the bank. Well, that's okay. Not guilty. Next thing you know, I had the first casino in Quebec. But, of course, they shut me down and uh, even gave me a month in jail. <laughs> Joke says, now I can only play solitaire. And so I came back to Ontario where they left me alone. And next thing you know, I had a huge casino with ads in the newspaper, cash car at the track. And uh, then they shut me down again. Casino owner charged. And they changed the meaning of a word to get me, even though Termel ran honest games. And uh, I still held the losing hand and <laughs> got convicted. But I only got accordion time, so community service, not so bad. 
So that is why I'm, if you Google for great Canadian gambler, I come up. But after I got shut down, my big casino, don't forget, the big casino was the Project Robin Hood that had 28 tables underground. And I would bet that's a world record. So anyway, Project Robin Hood, a nice compliment by the OPP. So then after that, I had to go and play poker because it was the only avenue left for me as a professional. So I went down to the United States and I spent five years playing professional poker at the Trump Taj Mahal in Atlantic City. Now, every card game's got this guy they call the professor who knows some of the odds. Well, you remember the movie uh, Rounders with Matt Damon with the scene at the Trump Taj Mahal with the chandeliers? Well, I was known as the professor at that Taj Mahal, the Trump Taj Mahal, and that'll come in handy later. So, I'd been so tired of being busted for gambling that I decided to run for parliament. And during one of the meetings, the people asked me, hey, what about inflation? And I said, inflation? Whoa, whoa, whoa. How come my casino chips don't lose their value and the government's chips lose their value over time? What's going on? The hardware's identical. It must be a software problem, how the chips go in and out. So I did an engineering analysis, and in a nutshell, I figured out that interest is the culprit, usury, that causes all the instability. Everybody has to borrow 10, say, liters or gallons of water from the pump house, and then they dump it into the economic pool and they all got to come back with 11 at the end of the game. Well, needless to say, there's not enough for everybody to come back with 11 at the end of the game. And now when you go in, you got to pledge something to get that original liquidity, that loan, right? Well, the last guy, when he comes out, he doesn't have his 11, he can't pay, so they take his stuff. Now, that means that even though you're to told inflation is an increase in the money chasing the goods, shift A, I've just shown you how interest causes a seizure, a foreclosure of the goods, which is shift B. So without any increase in money, if you have a bunch of seizure, you have a new kind of inflation, and I'm the only person in the whole planet who teaches shift B inflation. All economics books teach up over there, but not one person teaches down over here except me. <laughs> so... <clears throat> so therefore, now, here I am now, and I ran for parliament, and I lost. But then I said to myself, wow, I am the only electrical engineer in the planet specialized in gambling and in running my own casino interest-free bank. So I said, since it's the interest in the bank software that's gumming up their accounting, I saw it as my duty to reprogram the central bank's computers to replace the interest charge with a service charge. And I started taking banks to court. That was the legal strategy. And I take banks to court trying to ban the interest charge and get them to cover everything with a service charge, which has a different effect. Remember, when you borrow 10 11 someone always gets knocked out of the mort gage, which means death gamble in French, mort gage. Someone always gets morted. So I saw it as my duty to try and put an end <laughs> to the mort gage loan system and kept running for parliament and started attacking the banks and the courts as well as helping defendants stall their foreclosures. I came up with these stiff the bank kits, fill in your name. I'll provide the arguments about why the mortgage violates the genocide section by knocking people out and the gaming house section by making them a fee for the privilege of participating in a gamble, the death gamble. And those are the arguments used and to repudiate the interest on their loans, not the principal. So I helped a whole bunch of people with those kits. So finally there was the economic. There were three t tactics, political, legal, economic. In 1984, I heard about the Let's software being developed out in British Columbia by Michael Linton. And I called him up and I said, uh, does this software charge any interest? Nope, nope. What's it based on? People's time at work. And I said, okay, I'll help you. I'll finance the development of the Let's software. 
and by 1999 the it's a time bank software people log on unemployed parents for instance and they log on what nights they can double duty babysit each other's kids and then pay each other with one hour bills even when they're broke now the mechanic will start taking three hours per hour because he wants the babysitter and the dentist might start taking six hours per hour because he wants it too and some babysitters will start asking for one and a half and two hours because they're so good and everybody wants them free market so that is how a support network grows around people who start up a let's time bank and every time a country crashes if you search around they always talk about the let's the original software for time banking that these communities are all basing their time bank networks on so those are the three things i had to do and and finally in 1999 this is neat i went to europe 39 nights out of 40 i paid with an iou for a night back in canada worth five hours because they've agreed between countries you know I mean five hours is worth a hundred green francs in Germany I mean 300 green francs in France and 100 green marks in Germany and 30 green pounds in Britain but between nations will trade hours so I came back on 195 hours or 39 nights I got to put people up for them putting me up over there that's how time banking works so in 2000 I got invited to the United Nations. Remember the big casino bus? Well, I made a million bucks. And I had to spend it before they could take it under proceeds of crime. So I blew it on founding a political party and I ran for Prime Minister of Canada. More candidates than the Green Party. And that meant that in 2000, I was allowed to be invited to go to the United Nations Millennium Assembly as a non-governmental organization. So, great, I'm gonna go. Then I got an invitation from the Globalization Committee to do the speech on the banking system of the future because the clerk of the committee had been a, a single parent, a member of Let's in Australia in one place and then in a second place and she was moving to a third place where they had a Let's and she told the chairwoman, this thing really works. If we're going to walk out of here with anything done, let's push this let system and this guy's talking about doing it worldwide. So they invited me to give the speech on the banking system of the future at the Millennium Assembly. So, at the speech, I coined a new expression. Let's means local employment trading software or system, okay? A system for trading employment locally, keeping track of hours. And I said, they said, what are you gonna call it? I said, okay, United Nations International and Local Employment Trading Software. If I can send my IOUs to France for the nights I spent in France, that's international, isn't it? But run by the UN. So that was the proposal. Well, the censors edited out the name Unilets and the great feature, uh, Interest Free, because so many countries had lets by then, but if they'd left the name in, they would have recognized what's being talked about. So that was the Unilet story. And I, in that thing, I first coined the expression, the time standard of money. Right now, it's the collateral standard of money, the stuff standard, the gold standard of money. But your time, not worth anything. In the world of the future, your time is what you're going to pledge to the bank. I promise to work it off as fast as I can. Thank you for the interest-free loan of the chips. So, now... You heard of quantitative easing. What's quantitative easing? Well, that was the Fed creating $20,000 billion, $20 trillion, and lending it to the banks, the loan sharks, interest-free, so they can loan shark it out to you. Could have lent it to you directly if they'd set up the accounting mechanism. And that basically is how you could reprogram the Fed to operate like PayPal. Or just think of it as a PayPal where instead of pledging your credit card for which you will work to pay it, okay, if you get cash to send to PayPal, you get to pledge your Fed loan or your time. So what happens when you end up with a Fed account. Well, if you got 20 grand debt at the bank on a credit card charging you 28% a year, you know, 5G's a year just in debt service, 
you, you might borrow 20 G's and pay it off. And now all your payments go against principal. And pretty soon you're out of debt. Four years if it's the whole five G's instead of another 25 <laughs> from the loan sharks. So that's the same idea as the casino. If there's any difficulty with the Fed figuring out how to run interest-free chips for all the borrowers, they just got to bring in the bankers who ran the bank at the Trump Taj Mahal. Say, how'd that work? Well, we opened up people's accounts. They all started at zero. And if they gave us markers, we gave them chips. And they bought back the markers as fast as they could. And that's basically how it could be run. So you could have the Fed giving everybody an account and running a PayPal on their own. Or you could simply having the Fed provide the money to people through an electronic connection. They can then pledge to PayPal and use PayPal's network of stores. So it's as easy as that to reprogram the Fed to give everybody an account. Not that hard. Now, let's look at the homeless for a minute. Now, you've got all these empty houses. Here's a deal if you want one of those houses. We're going to charge you for the depreciation on the house and just keep adding it to your debt whether you get out there and get a job or you don't. You're sick. We're going to keep adding the depreciation on the house and the upkeep. Just no more interest. Believe it or not, I would think that most of the homeless were formerly employed and will easily find new employment because what are people given new interest-free credit cards gonna buy not tanks you're gonna end up homeless people are gonna buy three of those million you know three million of those homes kids are gonna move out of their parents basements into the 15 million other empty homes now contractors they're gonna start hiring because everybody wants their houses fixed and auto repair guys they're gonna start hiring because everybody wants their cars fixed and healthcare clinics are gonna start hiring because everybody wants to have more treatments and all of a sudden, when people are waving their credit at the economy, people's services arise. And that is what would happen. So, as fast as people start spending with their new credit cards, job opportunities are opening up. And there's no vigorish to the middlemen. And that's the beauty of it. So, now, what can we do about it? Well, it just so happens that because of the effect that Scott Adams described of social media being the brain of the new political world, gee, I guess all we got to do is make the hashtag, I want my Fed account to go viral. So that's what I'm going to be naming this video. Win Biggestly, in honor of Mr. Trump and Mr. Adams, dot, dot, and hashtag, I want my Fed account. I'm ashamed to admit I'm new to Twitter, you know, but with 500 followers, I'm amazed at the number of people, followers they each have. So many people I've never heard of have 50,000, 100,000, 200,000, million. One person three days ago, 4.6 million followers, which means that... This is way, way, way beyond the amplification of one, two, four, six, eight. I'm thinking that, wow, there could be 50 million possible retweets of this message and this video, um, this hashtag, within days. So I'm hoping that there are some kind of feedback to that. I'm going to send mine off to Donald Trump saying, I hope that you give us an interest-free credit line at the Fed, including me. I'm Canadian. You can do it for us, too. So, if you want your Fed account, well, then, this is your chance to retweet this and try and make this viral. Because, last week, Janet, Janet Yellen raised the interest rates from 1.25% to 1.5%. Oh, only a quarter of a percent but it was still 20% increase. So everybody's debt service just went up 20% who got those great loans during quantitative easing. So that's the beginning of the crash if you let her get away with it because you're going to be the victim of that crash. Now, so finally, 
You can find my videos at YouTube slash King of the Poppers. Now, what kind of person in their right mind would want to be King of the Broke People? The only person who would, would be the guy with the duty to fix it for them. And I told you about my engineer's duty. You know, when Canadian engineers graduate, they give us this iron ring and a solemn ceremony that not only are we not allowed to let the nuts get loose, we're not allowed to leave machinery broken. So, yeah, over the next 38 years, I've run in 93 elections spreading the word about how interest-free banking works and I call that doing my duty. They've had a lot of fun. I've been called super loser fails again and I've had reporters asking me snarkily how does it feel being called the fringe and I say well it's not so bad when they call you king of the fringe. So I have done my best to bring interest-free money reform, especially electronic money reform, to everyone's attention. I would point out that time banks have a basis of value, an hour of labor, behind their chips. Whereas all these new virtual cryptocurrencies you see online are chips issued with no value backing them up. And someday, <laughs> luckily poor people won't get hit with these bubbles, but a lot of rich people will. So, I have a site, smartestmanonearth.ca. How dare the guy who says he's got the closest education to Mr. Spock on the planet say that. Also, smartestman.ca. And I just want to reassure you that if you can make this video and this hashtag go viral, you're going to have the best, winningest Christmas of your lives. So, on the best day of Christmas, my true Fed gave to me quantitative easing with a credit card paid interest free. So, do your bit to help out. I've done all I can do. Now I'm going to sit back and watch and hope that this virus explodes and you go out and get what you have the power to do. After all, if Mr. Spock could find a way to house 3 million people with 18 million empty homes, maybe we can too.